In the second part of kinetics, we're going to talk about the rate law. As defined, the rate law is an equation that relates the reaction rate to the concentration of the reactants. And so for the simple reaction where A turns into the product D, we can write this rate law equation where we have rate on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, we have some type of function where the concentration of reactant A appears. Now, parts of this equation we already know. The bracket A is the reactant concentration. And on the left-hand side, for rate, we learned that we can write that in the previous section as either the formation of the product with respect to time or the disappearance of the reactant with respect to time. The basic form of this reaction is simply to say that the concentration um, will determine the reaction rate. And this should make sense from collision theory where having a higher concentration of reactants means a higher collision frequency which in turn means a higher rate. Now there are other terms in this rate law. This power is also very important. It's called the reaction order. And it is either the power or exponent that the reactant concentration is raised to. And lastly, this constant K is called the rate constant. And it is just a constant of proportionality between rate and A raised to the power of N. One important thing to keep in mind in this rate law equation is that the rate, the rate constant, and the reaction order all have to be determined experimentally. So the value of N or K is not something that you can glean just by looking at the chemical equation, but you actually have to measure through experiment. And oftentimes, you can use this relationship um, and measure rates to then solve for k and n. Now, in the next couple of slides, we're going to delve into the reaction order and the rate constant in more detail. So reaction order n, we've already defined as a power exponent of the reactant concentration. And we've already said it has to be determined experimentally. Um, one thing that's not obvious is that actually n can really be any value. An integer, it can be 0, it can be a fraction, it can even be negative. And depending on what that value specifically is, it does give you some insight about how the reaction happens. In general chemistry, we're really going to focus primarily on reaction orders that are mostly on the simple side, so n equals 0, 1, and 2. And we can define these types of reaction as 0th order, 1st order, and 2nd order. And if we just plug their respective n values into the rate equation, we can then write the rate law um, using the general equation just by replacing n with 0, 1, and 2. Now, in math, anything that's raised to the power of 0 is automatically 1. And so for a 0th order reaction, the rate law simplifies to just that rate is equal to the rate constant. And this is really important because this means the rate is completely independent of the concentration of A. Now, for first and second order, rate does depend on the concentration of A, but in the first case, it's linear for first order, and for second order, it's actually dependent on the concentration squared. The rate constant K has been defined as the constant of proportionality between rate and concentration raised to the nth power. It's also determined experimentally. Um, what's interesting about K, it does have units, but they will depend on what that reaction order is. And another important thing about K is that it changes with temperature. 
So k is a function of t. So we can again look at the zeroth order, first order, and second order reactions and basically figure out the unit of k for each of these three cases. So how do we do that? Well, we can first write the rate law for zeroth order where rate is equal to k. And remember that the units of rate is concentration per unit time, typically expressed as mole over liter times seconds. And so if this is the unit on the left side and k is the only thing on the right side, then the unit of k is simply the same as that of the rate, mole over liter times second. Now what about for first order? For first order, the rate law is rate equals k times the concentration of A. So now besides the units of rate, we're also going to put into this equation the units of concentration, mole over liters. And now k units would have to equate both the left and right side. And you can see that the only thing missing here is 1 over second. So the unit of k for first order reaction is simply 1 over s. In second order reaction, we basically follow the same strategy. We write the rate law, rate equals k times concentration of a squared. We put in the units for rate on the left. And for the units for concentration on the right, um, and not forgetting to square that. So we have mole squared over liter squared. And if I want to figure out the units for K for second order reaction, I want to be able to equate the units on these two sides. And so you can see that um, we need to factor in mole, we need to factor in liter, and we also need to factor in seconds. And so if we have liter over mole times second, then we can get um, the two sides, their units, to become equal. Now you can also write a rate law for more complex chemical reactions, like this one shown here where reactants are A and B, and there's two products C and D, and lowercase a, b, c, and d represent their stoichiometry or the coefficients in the balanced reaction. So just like before, we can write a rate law where rate appears on the left-hand side, and then on the right-hand side, we'll have the concentration of the reactants, both A and B here, be multiplied, um, and each of them is raised to um, their own power, N and M. And like before, the reaction rate can be written in terms of either reactant or either product. And in this more complex form, we just have to remember that the reaction rate um, also takes into account the coefficients. So here, the formation of product D with respect to time is being divided by the coefficient uh, D. OK, so reaction order, again, is referring to these exponents. But because there's two of them, the overall reaction order is actually going to be their sum. So you can say that a reaction is n order in A, nth order in B, but the total reaction order is the sum of n plus m. And just to reiterate, n and m have to be, de have to be determined experimentally. Um, they're not necessarily related to the coefficients of the reaction. And N and M do not change with temperature. K is, again, the rate constant. And the unit, again, depends on reaction order. But now I have to keep into mind that this is the overall reaction order, not just M or N. And again, the rate constant can vary with temperature. OK. so. The fact that temperature appears in this rate law shouldn't be surprising, because from collision theory, we learned that if you raise temperature, you can raise collision frequency, which increases rate. But also, if you raise temperature, you raise the collision energy, which is also beneficial to rate. So this dependence on temperature is actually captured in the rate constant. 
um, K. And so it's important that K is a function of temperature because basically the concentration and reaction order are not. In this class, we're going to use two experimental methods to determine or deduce the rate law. So the first method is called the initial rates method, and this is really the topic of the rest of this lecture. The second method is called the integrated rate law. In the initial rates method, what we do is that we can vary the initial concentration of a reactant. The output then is to measure the reaction rate and to see that as we vary the reactant, how does the reaction rate change? The integrated rate law is a topic of the next section. But for now, the difference is that you can monitor or measure the concentration of the reactant at various time points during the full time of a reaction. And with those data, you can plot concentration versus time and determine the functional form of that plot to figure out the reaction order. This is a simple example of a reaction where we just have one reactant A that turns into a product B. And so the rate law then only varies as a function of the concentration of A. And I would like to illustrate how we can use these two experimental methods to figure out both K and N. So we also have a concentration curve plot here. So the y-axis is concentration, and A is shown here in purple, and it's the reactant cisplatinum. It's not important right now what cisplatinum is. Um, but as A disappears, the product chloride anion is forming. And in the initial rates method, we actually don't need to follow this reaction through the whole time course. But what we want to do is to start with one initial concentration of A. So that would be A naught, where the naught refers to the concentration of A at time zero. And we just want to measure the next concentration of A as some time interval um, T1. And in this plot here, T1 is set for 100 minutes. So if I start with this concentration of A0, which is basically 1 times 10 to the minus 2 molar, um, I basically watch it decline at, in the first 100 minutes um, to somewhere about 8.5 times 10 to the minus 3 molar. And that would be one measurement. And then in my next experiment, I could vary A0, and let's say I want to vary it over a wide range, so anywhere from 5 times 10 to the minus 3 uh, to 5 times 10 to the minus 2 molar. So in the next experiment, let's say I start with A0 being 5 times 10 to the minus 3 molar, and for the same time interval, I measure the next concentration. And with these two concentrations and knowing what this time interval is, I can basically calculate the initial rate at this concentration versus the initial rate at this lower concentration. And by doing some math, which I'll show in the later slides, you can basically figure out the reaction order. Now, the integrated rate law works in a different way, and that's simply you monitor the concentration over the whole time course. So let's say I'm taking data on the concentration of A at each of these time points. And so maybe in this case, I'm varying time here in this plot from 0 to 1,200 minutes. And I'm taking a data point at every 100 minutes. And my A0 um, is just one value, and basically, I just need to run this one experiment. So last time, you might have remembered this reaction here, where we wanted to know basically what happens inside this black box. How does 
nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide become converted into nitric oxide and carbon dioxide. So we can make a hypothesis and then use the experiment to test whether that hypothesis is wrong or consistent with what we guessed. So one initial guess I had was if you see the linkages here, it almost looks like you can snip one of the nitrogen oxygen bonds in NO2. And then if you can pass that oxygen atom to carbon monoxide, then you would form carbon dioxide. So maybe the way this reaction works is a collision between these two reactants, where in that collision, the oxygen transfers from one reactant to the other to give the products. So we can design an experiment to test this hypothesis, and we're going to use the initial rate method. But basically, if this hypothesis is correct, then the rate will be proportional not only to the concentration of NO2, but also to the concentration of carbon monoxide. So we would expect the rate law to have both of these reactants appear if this hypothesis is correct. So here's how the experiment was run. Um, so again, here's the reaction equation, and here is the general rate law. And so both reactants appear with their reaction orders M and N, and the rate constant K. And the point of this problem is to figure out what K, M, and N are. So there were three experiments run here where basically you can vary the initial concentrations of both reactants, and then you simply measure what the initial reaction rate is. So these are kind of nice numbers in that you can kind of do the math in your head. So if I compare experiment one and two, and I look at the initial concentrations, I can see that the CO concentration is kept constant, and the only concentration changing is NO2. And it basically is being increased by a factor of four between um, experiment one and experiment two. So how does the initial rate change? Well, if you compare the initial rate of experiments one and two, you'll see that experiment two is actually 16 times greater than that of experiment one. So when the concentration of NO2 is quadrupled, the initial rate changes by 16 fold. Another observation you might make is by comparing experiments one and three. In this case, the initial concentration of NO2 stays constant, but the initial concentration of CO is doubled. So we change from 0 0.10 mole per liters to 0 0.2. And how does the initial rate change? And you'll see the measurements of initial rates in experiments one and three is exactly the same. So there is no change. So the first simple conclusion is that CO does not affect the rate. Another way of saying that is the rate is independent of the concentration of CO. Therefore, CO would not appear in the rate law, and the power in this rate law for CO, N, is zero, and that way it would drop out. Now, going back to experiment one and two, um, NO2 does affect the rate, and specifically when the initial concentration of NO2 is increased four times, the initial rate responds by increasing 16 times. And so the only way this would happen is if the reaction order for NO2 is two, because four squared would give you a 16-fold increase in rate. We can take all that information and put that into the rate law. So now we know that the rate is equal to the reaction constant times the concentration of NO2 squared. 
So one point I'd like to make again, there is no relationship necessarily between the reaction order and the coefficients in the chemical equation. Okay, so the next step now is to solve for the rate constant K. And so we can use any of these three experiments to plug in the initial rate and the initial concentration, and that leaves us only one variable, K, that we can solve for. So in this first step, I'm going to rearrange the rate law to solve for K. So K is equal to the rate divided by the concentration of NO2 squared. And then I'm going to plug in values here, and these numbers come from experiment two. Um, you can use, again, any experiment that you want, as long as you use the data from that single experiment. So the initial rate um, is up here, 0 0.080 uh, concentration per second. And then in the denominator, I have the initial concentration of NO2, which is 0 0.40 molar, and I square that. So if I simplify this math and simplify the units, I get that the rate constant is equal to 0 0.5 liters over moles times seconds. And so putting that all together, I can rewrite my rate law where the rate is equal to this constant K, which we know is equal to 0 0.50 liter per mole second and times the concentration of NO2 squared. Okay, so coming back to the hypothesis, um, it clearly is incorrect because the rate is not proportional to just NO2 times CO, but rather it was proportional to NO2 squared. And that does tell us something. It tells us that the reaction does not proceed by the simple collision as shown. And stay tuned to figure out what the reaction mechanism might be. Perhaps that last section went a really fast. So I'd like to follow up and show you a step-by-step -step method to figure out the reaction order using the initial rates method. Now the crux of the initial rate is that usually you have to solve for multiple variables, like in this case where we need to figure out k, m, and n. And one way you can get rid of these variables um, to make the problem more tractable is to take ratios. So for instance, if I take a ratios of two different rates, so let's say the rate of experiment two over the rate of experiment one, I can write them in above here. So experiment two, this is the rate law. And then for experiment one, this is the rate law, and they look very similar. Of course, the absolute values of concentrations are different. The K is the same. And so by taking this ratio, I can basically cancel out K. And because I chose experiment two and one as a ratio, you'll see that the concentration of carbon monoxide um, stays constant. So in that case, they're also equivalent and they can also cancel to one. And so the only thing I'm left with is that the ratio of these rates is equal to just the ratio of the NO2 concentration raised to their reaction order M. And because M is the same value for both experiment two and one, I can rewrite that and put that outside the ratio of these two concentrations. And then with the simplified form, taking this on the left and this on the right, I can basically plug in numbers to solve for M. So here we go. We plug in the rate for experiment two over the rate for experiment one on the left side. And on the right side, we have the concentration of NO2 from experiment two over the concentration of NO2 from experiment one. And here, M is the only variable left.
so we can basically solve for m. So the left-hand side of that equation simplifies to 16, and the right-hand side simplifies to 4 raised to the power of m. And if you rearrange this for m, you would find that m is equal to 2.